Expanding on his commitment to forest management and sustainable forestry, in 1909, W.R. Brown was appointed to New Hampshire's Reorganized Forestry Commission. The new commission provided for a forest protection and control system administered by the Department of Forestry, and it hired the first state forester, Edgar C. Hurst. Brown continued to serve in this capacity until 1952. As commissioner, he was instrumental in shaping New Hampshire's forestry laws and the selection of state foresters. W.R. Brown also played an indispensable role in the formalization and formation of private associations related to the working forest. Associationalism at the turn of the 20th century was infused and galvanized by the progressive business practices of the era. The number and variety of private associations proliferated after the turn of the 20th century. The government saw the emergence of business associations as a desirable mechanism for disseminating information. Conversely, the new associations saw themselves as agencies through which they can influence public policy. At the same time, business leaders, influenced by developments in the fields of sociology and social work, recognized that they had a responsibility toward society and the environment. This gave rise to increased philanthropical efforts and to associations influencing these efforts. For example, the National Civic Federation, formed after the Pullman strike in 1894, worked with businesses, civic, and union leaders to solve the Chicago labor problems. W.R. Brown, an advocate of business progressivism, embraced the concept of associationalism with a passion. He was instrumental in the formation of a number of civic and industrial associations to address the problems of concern to the forest products industry. Early on, W.R. Brown joined with his brother O.B. and others to establish the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests in 1901. The Society recognized the importance of preserving the forest and protecting the scenery, but not at the expense of the forest products industry. It observed that every honest, well-informed man believes that the forest is necessary, first because of the protection it affords, and second because of the industrial importance of the products which it yields. At the Society's first meeting in 1901, the minutes state that O.B. Brown gave the progressive view of the enlightened lumberman concerning his company's operations on the presidential range, stating that this area would be cut in a conservative manner to preserve its scenic values. Continuing in this tradition, in 1910, W.R. Brown and others called a meeting in Gorham, New Hampshire to discuss and proceed with the formation of a Timberland Owners Association for special fire protection on their lands. Other states had already begun to utilize protective associations of the Timberland owners in aid in combating forest fires. The first such association of landowners was formed in Idaho in 1906. In the next four years, 24 others were organized in the West and five in the East. States had a vested interest in cooperating with protective associations because states suffered a direct loss of taxable interest in the timber destroyed. Such a loss was more absolute in forest land because it was not covered by insurance and was removed from the tax list during regrowth. Brown went on to work with landowners to form protective associations in Maine in 1912 and in Vermont in 1915. New Hampshire State Forester Edgar C. Hurst served as a director on the Maine Association and W.R. was one of the first directors of the Vermont Association. In 1916, W.R. Brown also participated in the formation of the St. Maurice River Protective Association in Quebec. It should be noted that Berlin Mills Company had substantial land holdings in all three regions. Brown served on the board of directors of a number of other groups relating to the forest products industry in the early 20th century, reflecting his commitment to the progressive notion of business associations. These included the American Forestry Association, Society of American Foresters, American Pulpwood Association, the Quebec Forest Industries Association, Canadian Pulp and Paper Association, and the Forest Research Council. Next, I want to look at the changing business patterns in New Hampshire Timberlands and the breakup of large land ownership following the Great Depression. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt tried to mitigate the increasing fears of American business by demonstrating that he had a plan to ameliorate the economic crisis. Government officials initiated banking reforms while businesses had to confront more localized issues on their own. Brown Company, whose name was changed from Berlin Mills Company in 1917 following outbreak of war with Germany, initially believed it had escaped the worst of the Great Depression. The 1931 international monetary crisis changed all that, undermining Brown Company's bonds and sending the company into a deadly financial tailspin. By 1932, the company no longer had the funds to operate its winter logging camps. Without wood to operate the mills, the company faced bankruptcy. In the fall of 1934, Brown Company notified the city of Berlin of its intent to file bankruptcy. Only through the effort of local, state, and national leaders was the company saved for complete bankruptcy and allowed instead to enter into receivership. Devastated and humiliated, the Brown Company family members began to divest themselves of many of their holdings. 
W.R. Brown auctioned off his beloved Arabian horses and funneled the sale proceeds back into the company. Although the company survived and family members remained on the board of directors, the new president appointed by the courts, Lawrence Whittemore, had a completely different vision for the company's future. W.R. Brown continued as manager of the company woods department and to serve on the various boards and commissions that had shaped his early career. Technological changes, however, were reshaping forestry as the company entered a more tumultuous decade. In the late 1930s, logging practices shifted from seasonal winter operations to the all-year trucking with the construction of a network of gravel roads. In the late 20th century, logging methods changed. To a large extent, saws were done away with and entire operations were carried out by men operating air-conditioned tree harvesters. The logging camps were also eliminated and loggers began working an eight-hour day and returning home at the end of the day. Concomitantly, the Timberland Owners Association's foot patrol programs were replaced with motorized patrols having radio equipped trucks that enabled them to communicate with the fire towers. Soon an air patrol was to be added. As Brown Company's economic viability continued to decline, it again entered bankruptcy in 1941. This time, none of the family members remained on the board of directors. Whittemore began to consolidate production. Eventually, the company and the lands were sold to outside investors. I want to end with a look at the future of forestry and to do so by posing a few questions. In the 21st century, with the loss of New Hampshire's pulp and paper industry and its influence over how the forest is managed, what is the future of sustainable forestry? How will the forest be used as an economic resource? To what extent will individual or small outside economic interests continue be to be a part of that picture? What have you seen change in forestry, and how has the Timberland Owners Association adapted to these changes?